Hello and welcome to Father Spitz's Universe. I'm Doug Keck. This is the place in our universe where faith and reason collide. Very interesting location. And coming to you from our EWTN studios in Irondale, Alabama, where it all began on Mother Angelica Way. And we're into part two of the historicity of Jesus' resurrection. Now we're going to be focusing on Father's favorite, the Shroud of Turin, and arguments for and against it. Remember, you can email us your questions at spitzersuniverse at EWTN.com. Post your questions on our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash EWTN online, hashtag FSUniverse. And also, you can send us a tweet at twitter.com forward slash EWTN, hashtag FSUniverse. And there's also the Magis Center for all things that relate to Father Spitzer and his work, magiscenter.com, a wonderful website. Don't forget that this month, we've got all those great Fatim events underway throughout the month here on EWTN as we begin the 100th anniversary coming up of Mary's appearances in Fatima starting in May. And we're going to take you month to month, message to message, all the way to the Miracle of the Sun in October. Stay with us here, the 100th anniversary of Fatima, the best place to see all the great events. And we now join someone of interest, Father Robert Spitzer, ensconced in his beautiful studios there high above the Christ Cathedral campus in Orange County, California here. And it's good to see you again, Father. And uh, great to be able good to talk to you. Good to see you. you, Doug. What little I see. <laughs> that's right. Well, that's right. But hopefully, we're, we're all praying. Uh, we all, certainly are all praying that uh, this September, uh, the FDA gets their act together and, uh, and you get the go-ahead for you that know. special surgery that uh, we pray will uh, move you in the right direction and uh, enhance your already great skill set. Thank you. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, something we can talk about right now, which is we talked about the resurrection, the historicity of it, and we also talked about how we were going to lead mm -hmm. into the Shroud of Turin. So let's get started since this is a part two and we had a lot of questions we never got to. Here's sure. the first one. Great. Considering the abundant sure. evidence on the Shroud of Turin, why is it not more widely known? How does the secular world account for its existence? Your information on the subject is great, but I haven't heard much about the Shroud elsewhere, not even, and this is always interesting, not even in Catholic circles. Thank you. And this is Patrick from Kentucky. Uh, great question, Patrick. Um, to be frank, there is one principal reason why the shroud kind of fell off the radar screen. And that was in 1988, there was a carbon dating that was done by three reputable labs one at Oxford, one in Zurich, and one at, uh, in, in Phoenix, Arizona. <clears throat> and when those um, uh, uh, tests were done, uh, it was revealed that um, the shroud had been produced uh, probably in the 15th century. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, uh, I was one of the people who suckered for this 100%. I, uh, you know, I thought these are three reputable labs. The people who, take t who took the sample must have been reputable. I gave my assent over. I, now, I had been a, a fan of the Shroud prior to 1988, had been following the STIRP investigation, the Shroud of Turin Research Project, the big 1978 investigation, the volumes and volumes of data that were produced. And then in 1988, I was mind blown. I, I, I just couldn't believe it because the reputation uh, you know, was so strong uh, for the Shroud of Turin. Mm -hmm. However, uh, I found out about uh, 15 years later, mm -hmm. so this, I mean, in 1998, already it was known that the strand, the single strand that was taken for that 1988 testing, that strand was very defective. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the reason was it was taken, first of all, from a, a very problematic part of the cloth. It was a corner of the cloth that had been visibly patched later in the 15th century by sisters that were trying to patch the cloth and put a back cloth on the linen uh, after the fire of Charnay, so uh, of, um, of Chambray, excuse me. And, and when that happened, um, uh, you know, these, these fibers were, were woven into it. Now, what was found out later, uh, this was probably in 1998, uh, Sue Benford and other people uh, actually showed that this part of the cloth was highly controversial. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing is they were supposed to take seven different samples 
from seven parts of the cloth and have them tested by a pyrokinesis expert and a materials expert before it, the, the samples were actually sent in to make sure that they belong to the linen. Mm -hmm. None of that was done. A single thread from a highly controversial corner of the cloth was taken, it was split into three parts, and then sent to the three reputable labs, where of course they get the result of the 15th century. Mm -hmm. However, when Sue Benford did her reporting, then a group of the physicists who had been working on it, and especially this fellow, uh, Dr. Ray, Raymond Rogers, and he was really a physical chemist and a uh, thermochemical expert, uh, you know, um, and he uh, basically was able, by locating where the, the sample was taken from uh, in the 1988 uh, uh, dating, they, they had cameras on the clock, they could see precisely where it was taken from. He then got fibrils from the cloth that were taken in 1978 from the exact same spots. Mm -hmm. He then took those fibrils and identified the following three, well, uh, problems. First of all, he subjected uh, those um, uh, fibrils that were taken from the exact same spots. He subjected it to several different uh, thermochemical tests, and he elucidates every single one that he put it through. But mm -hmm. at the end of you know the the spectrometry, the pyrokinesis, et cetera, et cetera, when all the tests are completed, it's very very clear that the sample that was taken could not have possibly been from the original linen. First of all, the sample that was taken would have had cotton in it. And there wasn't any cotton at the time of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And certainly there wasn't any dyed cotton, mm -hmm. and certainly not any dyed cotton that used a gum dye mordant, which only came into Europe in the 11th century. So for all intents and purposes, the sample, mm -hmm. right, which would have had cotton, dye, and a mordant to tie the dye to the, uh, uh, to the cotton. That wasn't available until Europe much later. Mm -hmm. This couldn't have come from the original linen. And the cloth, by the way, is not cotton. <laughs> of course, mm -hmm. it is linen. And it's a linen that corresponds to uh, the kind the, and, and, the, and the twill and the weave that would have been available mm -hmm. during the time of Jesus. So at the end, Ray Rogers and then, of course, a variety of other chemists and physicists since that time have already discredited the 1988 carbon dating sample. Not mm -hmm. the dating itself, mm -hmm. that was done authentically, but the sample itself was clearly, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, a, a sample right. uh, that was almost. I can't say it was intentionally designed to deceive, right. but it came as close as you can well, possibly get right. to intentionally de designing well, to what deceive. Would you, what would you? And, but like I said, I, right. I didn't even discover this myself mm -hmm. until 2004. Right. Uh, so I was way behind the times, and 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 so I'm, I, I think the whole, all of us really suckered right, right. for this dating and now we just got to change all that mm -hmm. because there's been four other dating tests and a variety of other things that we'll talk about later that show that the shroud was really right. uh, created uh, around 50 AD. Right. Well, let me ask you this. Somebody might sit there and say, well, that sounds very sure. interesting, but if in, in 1354-ish when it first showed up in France or some period of time mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. that, if the people there really mm -hmm. believe this is really the shroud of our Lord, even if it was damaged, why would they try to repair it? Why wouldn't they just leave it now, the way it was? Out of piousness and holiness. I mean, essentially, the, the sisters uh, saw, you know, there, there's kind of this uh, fire damage that you can see down the sides of, uh, down both sides of the cloth where the cloth was folded. It doesn't touch the image mm -hmm. and it doesn't touch the blood stains, but you know, it was like, you know, it, 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 you know, it didn't look right and it, it looked damaged and they just didn't want, as it were, you know, damaged goods for our Lord. Mm -hmm. So they did in their own piety and their mm -hmm. own sensibility, they did what they thought was right. Mm -hmm. And that was you sew this up and you make it look good and they did a very fine job you know dyeing these cotton fibers I mean the, the, the dye is so close to the color of the linen you, you, you wouldn't
wouldn't notice. And of course, then they put a back cloth on it mm. because they wanted to make sure, right, that that the uh, the shroud itself, um, it, you know, would uh, uh, kind of remain, you know, intact and, and wouldn't wouldn't be, uh, you know, subject to as much uh, corrosion. Mm. You know, uh, this was their thinking at the time, right? Now we know a lot <laughs> differently today, right. but that was their thinking at the time. So it was really their own piety and their own desire to make sure that cloth was, uh, you know, burial cloth was adequately mm -hmm. preserved. Now, uh, as I mentioned, uh, you know, for some research that my assistant uh, Dottie did uh, looking into this was the idea, mm -hmm. we talked about 1354 when the shroud first shows up kind of in France. And, and one of the things that mm -hmm. concerned people at the time when there was a declaration, at least uh, apparently, that this wasn't true or maybe it was a fraud, somebody painted it, Etc. Mm -hmm. was the idea that there <laughs> yeah. didn't seem to have been a mention of it in the early church, or was there? Well, actually, when uh, Geoffrey de, Char uh, de Charnay gets a hold of this and then reveals to the bishop that he has the burial cloth of Christ, yes, uh, church authorities uh, are very much informed about this. Mm -hmm. Of course, it, it you know it, it it belonged to the House of Savoy, and uh, you know and it, it you know takes various trips you know uh, from one place to another you know to to show uh, the the burial shroud during that time. How, however, it, it did belong. Uh, to the House of Savoy, it, it belongs to the uh, to the church today. But incidentally, mm -hmm. uh, you know that that's that's very r r recent. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it didn't belong to the church uh, per se uh, at first, and, and so um, uh, you know these um, it, it goes through a series of kind of ownership transitions, right. but winds up in in right. the in the House of Savoy. Is there any and, and legitimate of course the, theme uh, theory I should say that you would Subscribe to it all that has has to do with you know from 33 A.D. to that time in the medieval time of where the shroud would have been. Yes, there there is what's called an indirect provenance. So in other words, uh, first of all, we've got four kinds of evidence. Um, you know, for where the shroud would have been. Uh, the first kind of evidence uh, comes from the coins on the man's eyes. And um, uh, uh, you can actually see that they used two Roman leptons uh, to place on the eyelids of the man in the shroud um, to keep the eyes closed uh, after the crucifixion. Uh, this was not an uncommon thing to do. Um, you know, with a deceased corpse to keep the eyes closed. And now there's a very good image of those coins that mm -hmm. you can see. And you can also use what's called digital overlay, uh, you know, photography. Uh, take uh, pictures of, of Roman coins today mm -hmm. uh, and, and lay them over uh, the, the man's eyes and see that these are Roman coins. Mm -hmm. Except for one thing, these coins have three enigmas. Mm -hmm. And those enigmas point to a very special minting of Roman leptons by Pontius Pilate in 24 AD. No. Pontius Pilate in 24 AD okay. in Jerusalem. So we know that there it is, the coins you know, showing up outside of Jerusalem are very rare. You have to go to a numismatist just to find coins with this enigma that go back to Jerusalem and that special minting of Pontius Pilate. But those coins are in the man's eyes. That gives you a strong sense of providence in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Second thing is uh, a Swiss criminologist by the name of Dr. Max Fry, mm -hmm. uh, he, he basically was the world's greatest pollen grain and pollen fossil expert. Uh, essentially what he did was he, uh, I, he's got the largest collection of pollen grains and fossils in the world from just about every species of plant imaginable. So he goes through with a fine tooth comb, he goes through every single pore on that linen and picks out all these pollen grains and fossils. What does he come up with? He comes up with four different groupings. Yeah. The major grouping is from, again, Jerusalem. And specifically, there are six uh, pollen uh, grains that are uh, indigenous mm -hmm. 
to Jerusalem and northern Judea and have never been found anywhere in the world beyond northern Judea except on the Shroud of Turin in, in, uh, in uh, uh, Liri, France, when it suddenly uh, appears and, of course, is retained on the linen all the way through its province today. So that's a second clue. But then we also know that it went to Edessa, Turkey, because the second largest group of, of pollen uh, grains is from Edessa, Turkey. And there are three ways we identify it from Edessa, Turkey. The first, of course, the pollen grains themselves. Three of those pollen gre grains are indigenous to the Edessa region mm -hmm. and nowhere else. So we know it was there. And secondly, there was a thing called the Mandilion, which was the face of Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, now we know that the Shroud of Turin was folded for about <coughs> 800 years after it leaves Jerusalem it's folded, it's put into a frame. The folds on the, on the shroud are still there mm -hmm. because they were pressed in that frame for so long that it actually, the picture of the shroud itself shows those folds. So uh, essentially, you, you know it was in the, you know, folded into a square with the face showing. And now we, we have fairly good evidence, mm -hmm. right, with the, the face showing. Uh, on the shroud. Mm -hmm. We've got um, uh, what's called iconographic evidence. And, and what is that iconographic evidence? There are 26 anomalies um, on the shroud of Turin which suddenly appear um, um, in the region of Ade in the iconography of the region of Edessa, Turkey, right around 300 AD. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, in 300 AD, we see all the icons change completely. First of all, uh, prior to that time, uh, the iconography of Jesus was Roman iconography. That is to say, a clean-shaven guy with short hair and, of course, these oh. kind of Roman okay. features. Mm -hmm. Now, 300 AD, in the desert of Turkey, we have a complete turnaround person with a beard, right. very long hair, and Semitic features, and of course all these strange marks of the beating, for example this big huge wound that's right above the nose that looks like a square with the top taken off of it, right? right. That suddenly appears in all the iconography, and of course they trace it back to, trace it back to the quote-unquote Mandelian. Mm -hmm. The Mandelian is the shroud folded up into a frame that's got the face showing and all of these other you know the the raised mm -hmm. left eyebrow you know the beating that took place and caused the swelling on the right side of the nose all this stuff suddenly shows up in the iconography of Edessa so we know it was right. there for about you know starting in about 300 okay. maybe earlier and it uh, suddenly around 800 seems to have been transported to three different churches in Constantinople. Mm -hmm. How do we know this? Because several of the early crusaders actually saw the shroud completely unraveled. All 14 okay. feet of it, right, is completely unraveled. And they saw the shroud there. And, and of course, um, you know, they, they report, you know, uh, you know, this is not just the face. Okay. This is the whole body back and front uh, of Jesus, which they, of course, believed was okay. the burial cloth. Very now, good. Now, suddenly... Uh, right before we get uh, to know, that we part, know, uh, Father, oh, we just yeah. got to take a break there. Uh, just uh, give you a chance to uh, catch your breath, and there, uh, there's so much more ahead. I know you could keep talking about this odd infinitum, and we've got much more our, our audience wants to take in. they got to take a break, too, so uh, we're going to be out there with Father Spitzer momentarily. Again, this is Father Spitzer's universe talking about one of his favorite subjects, which is the Shroud of Turin. A lot of people are interested in it as well. Stay with us. And again, thanks for staying with us here in the midst of Father Spitzer's universe. Jesus' resurrection, the Shroud of Turin is what we're talking about with Father Spitzer, who has spent a lot of time studying this. Let me ask you one quick question, Father. We talk about the image sure. coming from this spontaneous event. Now, why would yeah. that spontaneous event not have melted the coins that were on our Lord's eyes at this time? Well, would well you know... Um, uh, because it only the it, it, for the same reason it didn't uh, completely wipe out the cloth itself. Mm 
Okay. Uh, namely, um, that the burst of light energy was only one forty billionth of a second. And maybe I better uh, explain that um, uh, for a second. Um, well, this you've got one forty billionth of a second to explain it, okay? <laughs> that might not be enough. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, so, uh, <laughs> but anyway, the uh, the key thing is that um, um, we have, tr it's a completely unique image, and the reason that it is, is because uh, this image is only on the surface of the fibrils of the linen. It never penetrates into what's called the medulla or the middle of the fibers. Mm -hmm. So it's just on the very, very surface of the fibers. We now know what produced it, rapid dehydration. <clears throat> but the rapid dehydration has to be produced by light because the image itself is such a precise and refined image. Mm -hmm. In other words, the image is not only a, a, a perfect photographic negative image, it's a perfect three-dimensional mm -hmm. photographic uh, negative image, which I'm gonna explain in, in just a moment. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the main thing, though, of uh, 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 real consequence is that um, in order to do this, you're gonna need a lot of light we know that it could never have come from chemicals. Mm -hmm. It could have never come from dyes. It could have never come from any vapor, mm -hmm. right? Because all those things would have moved from the surface of the fibrils into the middle of the fiber and to the other side. Mm -hmm. And of course, that didn't happen with the shroud. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the same thing with scorching. If, if it had been like a heat as a source mm -hmm. instead of light as a source of the image, of course, it would okay. have scorched the, the shroud. And then, of course, it would have burned right into the middle of the fiber. And as a matter of fact, it would have burned through the fiber. And as a matter of fact, it would have just snuffed the whole cloth. Right, and the but coins would have melted for the then, time being. probably, well, right, if that was the Yeah, course, right. absolutely, absolutely. Right, right, okay. So we've only got really one solution left, which was proposed by a physicist named Dr. John Jackson and his team, namely that it would have to come from a very short-lasting burst mm -hmm. of high-intensity light radiation, and that's what we, we, we would call vacuum ultraviolet radiation. Remember, ultraviolet's the kind of light that it, it can burn you, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's got the intensity, but this vacuum ultraviolet um, uh, radiation is uh, uh, very short-lived. It can be in the order of 140 billionth of a second. Now, the only problem is we only have one source of this kind of light right now, and that comes from the laboratory from what's called an eczema ARF laser. So you, you're going to need a, 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 a very refined laser capable of producing this very short burst of highly intense vacuum ultraviolet radiation. How intense? It would have been on the magnitude of several billion watts. Mm -hmm. the, the, so the light would be the same as if you were like 10,000 miles away from the sun, mm -hmm. right? And you got that much light. Now, normally with that much light, you get the heat energy as well, mm -hmm. which means, of course, you would have vaporized along with your rocket ship. Yeah. However, if you can make the light short enough, like 140 billionth of a second, then that intensity of white light could actually, uh, uh, I should say a vacuum ultraviolet light, could actually turn a non-photographically sensitive cloth into a perfect photographic um, uh, uh, receiver mm -hmm. uh, so that you could have a perfect three-dimensional uh, photographic negative on that shroud. Mm -hmm. And that's precisely uh, what takes place. Now, when you look at that, you know, uh, that means that the dead body um, uh, of the man inside the shroud would have had to have produced several billion watts of vacuum ultraviolet radiation for a pulse of 140 billionth of a second. And of course, dead bodies don't do this. Mm -hmm. In fact, that exceeds all the eczema ARF lasers we have in the world today. Mm -hmm. The entire laser capacity of the world today still is inadequate to producing the image on the shroud from that one dead body.
but the mystery doesn't end there. Mm -hmm. The body has to become spiritual. In physics, we call it, it has to become mechanically transparent. That is to say, it has to lose its physical uh, solidity, the, the atomic structure that produces the effect of solidity that would keep the cloth from passing through. Mm -hmm. The cloth actually has to pass through right so you can get the inside right notice what you've got if the cloth doesn't penetrate to the inside of the body you're not going to get the bones in the hand inside the hand that are surrounded by the flesh on the outside in the correct three-dimensional proportions you're not going to get the rib cage you're not going to get the bones in the feet you're just going to get the surface of the body so the light has to be coming from every three-dimensional part of that body mm -hmm. and the body has to become spiritual mechanically transparent so that the cloth can pass through it and get the inside of the of the body as well as the surface of the body in the correct proportions in that 140 billionth uh, surge of light now Paolo Di Lazzaro mm -hmm. uh, and his team in 2011 replicated this precise effect uh, in the laboratory uh, in 2011 and it's been replicated mm -hmm. in other laboratories since that time. We have no other image. There, I don't care what anybody tells you. There's absolutely no way this was produced by a vapor. Mm -hmm. It was not produced by an oil. It was not produced by any dye, any liquid. None of that can possibly stand the scrutiny of pyrokinesis and spectrometry. It's absolutely absurd to say that those things would not have penetrated to the medulla of the fiber, which they would right. have, and, and, and have been tested a million times to have done so. So there's only, this is the only explanation that we have of this completely mysterious, perfect three-dimensional photographic negative image. Now, I, I gotta tell you, you know, every physicist I know mm -hmm. who's looked at this, every last one of them have said, you know, I'm a physicist. I like natural causes. Mm -hmm. I like physical causes. That's what I do for a living. But there is no physical cause of this image. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely impossible to produce by any known natural cause that we have. Dead bodies are completely incapable of producing several billion watts of energy for one forty billionth of a second, and of course, to to pass through the um, uh, to, to become completely spiritual, so that the cloth, uh, you know, mechanically transparent, so that the cloth right. can pass through it. This does not happen to normal dead bodies. You are talking about not just a supernatural cause, you're talking about a highly supernatural cause. And for all intents and purposes, the highly supernatural cause uh, replicates the resurrection of Jesus precisely as Paul has described it, precisely as the gospel writers have described it. Remember what I was saying in last week's show when I was, I was talking about how um, you know the gospel writers describe Jesus as transformed mm -hmm. in divine power and the spirit, and so they think they're seeing a, a spirit. They, they, they they're you know frightened. They're bowing down and worshiping. Mm -hmm. John's calling him Hakuriasmu, Hatheasmu. Etc. So we've got this, uh, you know, uh, obvious, you know, um, testimony to Jesus's uh, glorification, his spiritual transformation, you know, and, and all of a sudden, what do we get as, as evidence? It's almost like God just uh, left this little clue for all of us scientifically in interested guys. Here, you guys contemplate this for a while, mm -hmm. kablamo of the 21st century, because what comes up, of course, is a precise validation of the right. glorified and spiritual risen body, mechanically transparent, if we can use that language, with a high degree of light, right, and, 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 and spirit, right, essentially exactly as the gospel right. writers. It's a relic. 
literally a relic of the resurrection. There is no image like that mm -hmm. on any other cloth in any painting or anything else in the world. And this is the only explanation we have of it. If this isn't a supernatural right. cause, I don't know what is because we have tried to eliminate right every other possible explanation. Let me ask you and this question. And the forgery question. stuff, it's so lame. Right. It belongs to the first grade. Okay. I mean, people who propose this so stuff tell us, tell never us, have Father, done how any you really, spectrometry. Tell us how you really feel about that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but let me, let me ask you a question. In, in describing that as vividly as you did, so when this mo instantaneous yeah. moment happened, did our Lord's body uh, yeah. pass through the shroud? Uh, or did the, did our Lord resurrect and take the shroud off, or do we have an idea based upon what the shroud tells no, us? No, uh, he would have uh, absolutely the the shroud would have passed through him as he was passing through the shroud, as okay. it were. Okay. So the answer is yes, he okay. would have passed right through the shroud okay. uh, in that new light form, presumably in mm. one forty billionth of a second. Okay, very good. Let's let's have a question from somebody who uh, knows somebody, a uh, priest who has some scientific background, but seems mm -hmm. to be a little more questioning about uh, good. the uh, Shroud of Turin. And dear Father Spitzer, I sure. was told by a priest who is also an anthropologist uh, that since the eyes of Jesus on the Shroud of Turin are two-thirds of the way to the top of the head, that the Shroud has to be a fake. Could you shed some light, it's interesting you mentioned light, <laughs> uh, on this, considering what we just talked about, in Christ through Mary, and this is John with that question. And I've, seen, I've heard different yeah. times they talked about the length of the arms, I remember was another thing that had brought up in the past, but this yeah. has to do with the eyes. What, what yeah. say you? <laughs> well, I, I have to tell you, uh, this has been examined and re-examined a hundred times. I don't know what you, where he got this, this, uh, the, these factoids from. Um, but going all the way back to the time of Dr. Pierre Barbet, who wrote, you know, the first real anatomical analysis of the shroud. Uh, remember a couple weeks back, I was talking about the passion of Jesus, mm -hmm. actually probably three uh, weeks ago, and I was talking about all the historical facts. Those were elucidated by Dr. Pierre Barbet, a very, very fine uh, medical doctor who actually did all of the measurements vis-a-vis -vis the eyes, the wounds, right, the eyes in proportion to the head, the eyes in proportion to the skull, the jaw in proportion to the, to the skull, and so forth and so on. These things were done all the way back in the 1940s, right, by, by Barbet at, in his book, A Doctor at Calvary. Now that book itself has been, of course, you know, superseded in terms of the number of tests that have been done. So, you know, another 128 additional anatomical, physical, and, and pyrokinetic, and, and other kinds of, of uh, uh, spectro uh, spectrometry and uh, spectroscopy uh, examinations have been done in 1978 and post-1978 to the fibrils from the shroud. I mean, there's absolutely no way that that is factual. Okay. So uh, the, the priest who got this from his anthropologist friend uh, uh, regrettably uh, has got, uh, you know, a very mistaken uh, piece of uh, data. Mm -hmm. And of course, that, that, that datum uh, really, it, it needs to be compared mm -hmm. with the 1978 STIRP investigation. Okay. And also with, uh, by the way, there were, there were lots of non-Christians. Now, some of those non-Christians became Christians uh, after the STIRP investigation. Mm -hmm. But there were lots of them on the original STIRP team who were not Christians and who came over uh, to become Christians after the evidence began to manifest itself. But an anthropological or, you know, a physical skeletal uh, problem, an anatomical problem, mm -hmm. uh, -uh uh that just doesn't exist. And so somebody just got the wrong factoid and mm -hmm. probably, uh, for all I know, had a very defective image of the shroud, right. um, you know, to, to, to look at. So uh, uh, he, he needs a re-examination. That's well, all there well, is do, to that. Do you think that there, there, there are certain time periods, certainly, maybe after the carbon dating, but even other aspects, uh, you know, maybe post-conciliar church in times, uh, the idea that these kind of, these kind of, af these kind of like church affectations and accretions that, that certain people actually found somewhat embarrassing uh, because they thought it made, mm -hmm. made the mm -hmm. church look medieval. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, uh, the, you know, the church has been accused of that many a time, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, let's face it, there have been fake relics. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but you, you can't be ashamed of all relics because some of them are, are fake, right? Uh, and, and boy, this one, uh, you know, uh, like I said, just every physicist I know mm -hmm. who's looked at this cloth with any degree of seriousness and has looked at the actual test and the test data, um, you know, from the various investigations, mm -hmm. uh, and not one of them that I know is skeptical or ashamed, you know, at this particular relic. So that's just, uh, um, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that some people have tried to perpetrate frauds in, in the past. And, of course, that reflects badly on relics. And sometimes, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, everybody has a, a healthy sense of skepticism. Right. You know, uh, we've all heard the statistic, gosh, if you added up all the, you know, the, the parts of the so-called true cross, you know, it would weigh one ton or something like that from, you know, the very And So some of them have to be frauds and this and that and the other thing. I've, we've heard it all mm -hmm. and of course there are reasons for for being skeptical about some things but right. boy when you have the science on your side right. and the shroud of Turin has the science on its side I mean I, I just uh, would say not only would I not right. be afraid of it I'd be reading every single article you can get you can get that you know from my website manjacenter.com just go to that article called science in the shroud of Turin mm -hmm. I footnoted everything to every imaginable study and that's, that's been done, and there have literally been hundreds of them. So y you want to do that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, first and foremost. Secondly, uh, the other thing that, that you want to do is, is very much examine, uh, you know, the, the crucifixion of Jesus, mm -hmm. not just the resurrection and the production of the image. I mean, there's no doubt that the shroud has real blood on it mm -hmm. with real hemoglobin, with a real AB positive blood type, with a real partial DNA profile. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, Who's, what forge is going to fake a DNA profile? You can say, well, they, they, they put the blood on it, you know, after the fact and, and, and so forth. So they put real blood on it. But you don't put the real blood on it in the way, you know, that a, a criminologist today, right, mm -hmm. you know, um, who is very aware of forensic science can tell you this is the exact precise way in which the blood would drip. This is the way it would dry. This is where the serum would go. This is how the spangling would work. I mean, honestly, you're not going to get that because the blood produces that drip and that re-warming and then re-adhering to the cloth after a crucifixion. And not only is it after a crucifixion, it's after a very unusual crucifixion of Jesus Christ. In other words, you know, Jesus has a very unusual, you know, very few criminals, if any besides Jesus, had a crown of thorns. It only fits the accusation pitched against him. He called himself the king of the Jews here, will give you a crown of thorns. But of course, other criminals who were crucified did not have that. Other criminals that were crucified did not have a spear thrust into the side. And by the way, the spear imprint, as uh, I mentioned about three weeks ago in the Passion, it matches a Roman pilum perfectly, the kind of spear that's used. The 127, you know, whip marks on the back but the, it's not just that. It was a triple strand, which is the kind of whips that Romans used with bones and steel put into the ends of the whip. How in the world does a medieval forger know that? Did he have a whip handy with the bones and steel pellets still embedded in it and know the precise way in which the whip would strike the back and so forth and so on? My thought is this resembles Rome, Rome, Rome right to the core and it resembles Jesus uniquely right to the core. And so we've got very, very good evidence that of not only Jesus' resurrection, but Jesus' crucifixion in the precise, unique way that the gospel writers described it, which not only shows the validity of the shroud, but the validity of the gospel writers' accounts themselves. So the shroud gives very good validation of the Gospels. So, I mean, I got carried away there, but there is a ton of evidence that the Gospel writers were just spot-on accurate. And, uh, and we ought to take account of that because the unique features actually validate the shroud. And of course, science
sequence validates the blood, validates the uh, image right. uh, formation, validates the anatomy of the image, etc. So um, w w w this is really a remarkable, remarkable relic made for us really in the 21st century right. uh, to kind of take a look at. And, I, I was going to ask out. you that. But if you have faith, I was going to ask you that, you that too, because in some ways, you kind of have the, you know, kind of thinking of the people with the Bible code where, where they say, well, gee, because I have these computers now, I can figure <laughs> out and read back into it. But in a sense, what you just pointed out is very true, yeah. which is because of the technology today that we have, we have insights yeah. into it that those people never would have had if they were trying to make a forgery, yeah. or even those people who were appreciating it for what it actually was. Absolutely. I mean, you know, come on, who's going to put in pollen, uh, you know, uh, fossils and, and, and pollen grains from in indigenous to Jerusalem, indigenous to Edessa, and indigenous to Constantinople, you know, who's going to do this? Who's right. going to, you know, find Roman artifacts and tools? Who's going to put Roman coins in the man's eyes with a special minting? You know, who's going to, you know, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. I mean, anybody who believes this is a forgery today, plus, you know, <laughs> Giulio Fonti did those other uh, three tests, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Fourier transformed infrared spectroscopy, the Raman laser spectroscopy and the tension compressibility and and uh, and, and uh, mechanical tension compressibility tests, all of which you know mount up to show, along with Ray Rogers vanillin testing, uh, that the carbon dating was completely wrong. The linen dates back to 50 A.D., probably plus or minus 100 years, mm -hmm. uh, with about 95 percent certitude. Okay. That that's you know come on, you know this this is no forgery. I mean this this really goes back to the time of Jesus, to the time of Jerusalem, to the uh, time of Jesus in Jerusalem, to the time of, of Jerusalem uh, when Pontius Pilate was reigning, a and of course, the crucifixion resembles the unique crucifixion of Jesus with real blood and real partial DNA profile, and the, the image can only be produced, it's a completely unique image that can only be produced well, by an intense amount of, 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 of light that lasts for a very short burst of time, right. resembling that that could only be produced in a laboratory. Well, it's interesting, too. ARF laser. It's interesting too, Father, because you had yeah. perfect timing. We had some bursting lights in our studio while you had that <laughs> elongated explanation, so it was actually perfect timing. So we're going to take a break. Uh, much more ahead here with Father Spitzer as we're talking about the Shroud of Turin and the historicity of our Lord's resurrection. Stay with us. And we are back here in the midst of Father Spitzer's universe and the resurrection of our Lord and the Shroud of Turin. Back to you, Father, out on the West Coast. One of the questions just came into us. Dear Father Spitzer, this is an email. Mm -hmm. You know, in old paintings uh, of the crucifix and the crucifixion, the nails appear to be driven into the mm -hmm. middle of Christ's hands. Now in the Shroud of Turin, mm -hmm. it appears from the blood stains they were in his wrists. Could you please clear up this mm -hmm. confusion? Thanks, uh, mm -hmm. Marta. And it's also sometimes that yeah. it comes up with the question of people with stigmata and where it's, the location is as mm -hmm. well and why there seems to be a discrepancy if there is one. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Marta. Um, in the uh, actual burial shroud um, uh, of Turin, uh, we see that the, uh, that the imprints uh, going um, of the nails for the hands go, you know, angularly up. Uh, into the wrists and then up through the um, you know the back part of the wrist almost into the base of the hand and then into the wood and um, uh, as it turns out that's precisely where the Romans <clears throat> would have had to have done it as if they'd actually put it uh, into the flesh of the hand right here this is a very fleshy part of the hand and if they had put it there um, and tried to nail Jesus to the cross within one second his arms would have just pulled right through mm -hmm. those uh, his hands would have pulled right through those nails and his arms would have been dangling there and his body would have gone over right, right? and of course the, the Romans uh, being very experienced <laughs> people uh, you know uh, and uh, 
good experimentalists, as right. it were. Uh, they knew exactly where to put those nails so that the body, right. uh, the hands would not rip away or rip through them, uh, but uh, would actually hold him fast right. uh, so that he would uh, have to suffocate. So, um, uh, unfortunately, those uh, depictions and the paintings, mm -hmm. uh, they were off. I mean, you know, the artists weren't really thinking about physiology and, uh, and anatomy, um, and uh, they really weren't thinking about right. real crucifixions. They, they just, you know, thought they, you know, when the biblical writer said through the hands, they right. thought it was through the hands. Uh, but what they meant was it, it was through the base of the hand, mm -hmm. uh, and it comes up through the back of the hand uh, very slightly at the base there. Uh, and that's the way the biblical writers uh, described it. And the same thing with the feet. It's really going into the, mm -hmm. into the ankle there, uh, you know, as, as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but uh, essentially, that, that was just a mistake of depiction in the paintings. Uh, with respect to the stigmata mm -hmm. as, as well, uh, you know, I think God chooses to, to, to put the stigmata into the fleshy part of the hand because it would be, it's, it's painful but manageable. I see. Right. Okay. If it were actually in the in the wrist, you couldn't use your hand mm -hmm. at all. Okay. You'd be hitting that nerve. Uh, you, you would be able to do nothing with your hands right. uh, at all. So our okay. Lord, uh, you know, obviously gave those wounds in a very practical place for mm -hmm. the the saints to uh, receive the blessing of the crucifixion. Yet at the same time, not be rendered right. immobile. Okay, interesting. I, that's a great explanation. I had never thought about that aspect of it. Another question for you, Father, as we're winding things down on this program. Uh, a mm -hmm. little bit different, mm -hmm. but related. Now, when Jesus rose from the dead, did he raise himself, or mm -hmm. did God the Father raise him, or did the Holy Spirit raise him? And this is Patty from Alberta, I'm assuming in Canada. Thanks, Patty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, essentially, we can say two things about Jesus. Number one, um, you know, uh, uh, well, first of all, the Father certainly raised Jesus from the dead. Um, but conjoining him, right, um, would have been the divine nature of the Son and the Holy Spirit because they're using divine power. So you could say, yes, all three persons using the same one divine power, one divine nature, were responsible for raising the human Jesus from the dead. But the human side of Jesus' two natures, remember Jesus has two natures, a divine nature and a human nature. The human side of Jesus' nature would not have raised his human nature from the dead because he was still dead when the resurrection had to be affected, effected. So for all intents and purposes, we would just say that would be restricted to his divine nature, to the Father, and to the Holy Spirit using the one divine nature. So in a way, you kind mm -hmm. of had all the solutions, but it can't include Jesus' human nature. That, of course, was what was raised. Very good. Uh, another question I was going to ask you about. This one usually comes up in and around the time of the Shroud of Turin. It's the Sudarium Domini. Mm -hmm. what, what, what is that and how is mm -hmm. that, if mm -hmm. at all, connected to the Shroud? Yeah, that's very interestingly connected to the shroud. Uh, by the way, that's the, uh, also called the face cloth of Oviedo. Mm -hmm. So if you go on your Google, uh, Sudarium uh, Christi, uh, which is face cloth of Christ, or mm -hmm. face cloth of Oviedo, it's just, it refers to the same cloth. Mm -hmm. um, that's the cloth which we read about in John's Gospel that's rolled uh, uh, and, and put um, uh, into a place, a separate place, uh, by itself. Uh, these kinds of cloths uh, were used um, by uh, the you know Jewish people uh, to take to put on the face of a man uh, who would have been very you know uh, you know morbidly disfigured right um, let's say by a crucifixion uh, and they did not want the face you know when they, when they were transporting. 
uh, the, the body from the, the cross, transporting it then uh, to the tomb. They didn't want that disfigurement to be apparent. Mm -hmm. uh, moreover, uh, with a cadaver, as you know, especially a cadaver that has been uh, very severely beaten, uh, there are fluids that would come up uh, through the man's mouth or through the man's nose. And again, these fluids, uh, uh, you know, to see in, in your beloved person, right, the, the one you really love, to see that it would have been just uh, uh, too much. So they put this face cloth, and, and the interesting thing about the face cloth is it wrapped all the way around the head so that any blood stains, even on the nape of the neck, would have been uh, exposed, right, uh, you know, to the cloth. And so we know that that cloth has the same 124 wounds the same mm -hmm. as the man on the Shroud of Turin. The exact enigmas of the wounds, from the crowning with thorns, from the beating, etc., all these wounds are the same. So you know the odds. If this, if the Sudarium of Oviedo, the Sudarium of, 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 of Christi, if that did not touch the same face as the Shroud of Turin, mm -hmm. the odds would be a billion, 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 billion to one against mm -hmm. this uh, 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 happening by pure chance. So uh, pretty much they had to touch the same face. Now why is this uh, so relevant? Because we have a very good provenance for the Sudarium Christi. We know that the Sudarium Christi was put into the hands of a bishop in the 600s, and that uh, bishop conveyed it to a bishop in southern Spain who conveyed it to another bishop, uh, and that provenance was made very well known and recorded until it got to Isidore of Seville. Of course, Isidore takes a very, a saint, by the way, Saint Isidore of Seville, uh, takes it and, of course, has it deposited in the uh, Cathedral of Oviedo, mm -hmm. where it stays from the 7th century onward. Mm -hmm. Now, how in the world did that cloth touch the same face as the man uh, uh, in the Shroud of Turin mm -hmm. if the Shroud of Turin was produced by a, a 14th century forger? Uh, answer, it right. didn't. Mm -hmm. It obviously touched the same face way before that, We've got a provenance for the uh, Sidarium that goes back to the 6th century. We're fairly sure right around the 500s, right then, that uh, the Shroud of Turin had to exist at least then. And we know from the Pollen fossils, the, the, the Roman coins on the oh. man's eyes, and uh, the dating tests oh. of Giulio Fonti, uh, we know that it comes from about 50 AD. But it is, it, yes, I think the Sudarium of Oviedo is absolutely an authentic uh, relic, another authentic re relic right. of the crucifixion of Jesus. The reason it doesn't have an image on it but only the blood stains is because it was removed from the face uh, and rolled in a place by itself mm -hmm. when the body was actually put into the shroud as the Gospel of John makes very clear. And so I think you've got two very, very good uh, images there. Right. And both of them kind of validate one another. Sounds perfect. And a great way to end our yeah. two-part program having to do with uh, the historicity of the resurrection and, of course, also uh, talking about the Shroud of Turin. And don't forget, we wanted to mention your new book, of course. Tell us the title of it. Yes, uh, it's, uh, it's called The Light Shines On in the Darkness, uh, Transforming Suffering Through Faith. So uh, Ignatius Press book, uh, as I say, hot off the press, that talks not only about yeah. how to suffer well, but why an all-loving God would allow suffering. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. We shall see you, of course, next week. And on my way out, I want to mention also Mother Angelica's book on suffering and burnout as well. Both of these books, fine books available through the EWTN religious catalog, EWTNRC.com. Next time, we pick up our program on contemplation from several weeks ago. Don't forget our encore airings. Go to EWTN.com and find out all the times we're on television and also on radio. I'm Doug Keck. Thank you for joining us in Father Spitzer's universe. We'll return next week. Hope to see you then.